each year when they, they ran the Smirnoff event, and that was like the major Hawaiian event. Prior to it, they had an amateur um, Smirnoff that anyone could enter. And I'd come second to Michael Ho in 1973 in the amateur division. And the way it worked was the winner of the amateur division the next year got an invite to the pro division. So Mike had got the invite. I'd just missed out on getting it. And then that year I'd won the Matara contest and beaten PT and Michael Peterson and uh, you know the best Australian surfers at the time. So I'd written a letter to Fred Hemmings, who was the Hawaiian Connors director, saying that I got a second last year. I just missed out on getting in. I just beat all these Aussie guys, and some of them are in, in your event. And you need me in your event. It's going to make you better. And as it turned out, Rabbit and Sean had pretty much done the same thing. Um, and then it came down to on the day we knew that Tiger Macon from California wasn't there. So Fred was going to give the alternate spot to one of us. And I think about 10 minutes before the heat hit the water, Fred just said, you know, Mark Richard, your first alternate, you know, pay you $150 entry fee and, and grab your Connest single. And I'm just never expecting to get in. I didn't bring any money to the beach. And Rabbit, the, the eternal thinker and strategist, had, had bought money. So Rabbit coughed up and paid for me to go in the event, which is you know, pretty amazing. He could have just said, no, I've got money. Let me in instead. And then... I won that heat at sunset, which was like, I think, round one or round two. And then the next day, the swell got massive and they moved the event to Waimea, and that was the year Reno Abalera won. And when we got to Waimea in the morning, it was closing out, like it was 30 foot and breaking across the bay. Beautiful day, sunny, offshore wind, like not a drop of water out of place except for 30 foot waves closing out. Um, and nobody wanted to go out. Like, even the Hawaiian surfers, you know, the best Hawaiian surfers were telling Fred, you know, mad, someone's going to drown out there. And Fred had NBC, you know, American television there on the beach doing a documentary on it. And Fred um, also had a vision for surfing getting bigger and bigger and for pro surfing taking off. And the more publicity he could get for the events, the easier it would be for him to attract um, sponsors and TV coverage the next year. So Fred was, the, um, I think, the 1968 world champion. He won it in Puerto Rico. And Fred basically said, you know, you guys are all a bunch of, you know, scaredy, scaredy cats. If, uh, if, do I need to go out there and catch a wave to prove that it can be ridden? You know, this will be a monumental day in surfing history. You know, if we surf today, the vision will go all around the world. The event will be on next year. There'll be more prize money. The TV stations will be back again. And it'll be a, a great thing for pro surfing. And... Everyone just sort of pretty much gave in when Fred said he'd go out and ride a wave because we, well, the Hawaiian guys, I didn't know, but the Hawaiian guys all knew that he would. Um, and so the, the event went ahead and I was like in a heat. It was a semi final. I was scared shitless. Um, but I was more scared shitless of not going out because um, I had the option, like Jeff McCoy said, you know, if you don't want to go out there, you don't have to go out, because I think I was 17 at the time. But when it came down to who I was more scared of, I was less scared of, of Waimea Bay than I was of two other scenarios. And one scenario was having to face Sean and Rabbit and saying I chickened out, especially after Rabbit paid my entry fee. And the other scenario was I didn't want to go home and everyone go, how'd you go? And go, I chickened out, I wouldn't paddle out. Because I thought, there's no way I can go back to Newcastle and explain to people what it was like standing on the beach at Wyomere Bay with 30-foot waves. No one will understand it. They'll all just go, you know, you chickened out. You know, we're... <laughs> so I just figured it was easy to go out there and maybe um, sit on the shoulder and not take off. And then I could say, well, I was out there, but I had never been out there. I didn't know where to sit. I had a wine guys in the heat and I just couldn't get a wave. You know, they just were in position every time a wave came. I had all the excuses under the sun. Um, and then what happened is I got out there and I just went, I'm going to catch a wave. And I, it's something that, that I term coloured singlet mentality where the moment that singlet goes on, for me, all thought of preservation, all thought of nice guy, and as I mentioned before, I would have paddled over the top of my mum, all that stuff came to the fore 
and I just went, I'm out here, I'm going to catch waves, you know. They used to ride, read the results out sort of backwards and there were six man heats and there was a 50% progression. So they kind of went, you know, six, I wasn't six, fifth, I wasn't six, and I'm just going, I've got to come forth, please let me come forth because if I come forth, I don't have to go back out. So when they announced fourth, I pretty, you know, fourth place Mark Richards from Australia, I jumped and, you know, punched the air and yee-haw like I'd won the event.